I was talking to you about living in Uttarkashi. Uh, Baba ji had gone off. He was supposed to come back in six months. I was learning Sanskrit, visiting ashrams, um, meditating on the banks of the Ganga, and every day, once, no, twice, morning and evening, going to the Kashi Vishwanath temple, sitting down quietly, and then going back to my Kutir. Now, this continued for some time. There was one, um, another uh, sannyasi, I think his name was Lakshman Guru, uh, Lakshman Giri, probably Giri, I forget the last part, Lakshman. This sadhu is a tall, thin sadhu who has been living in Uttarkashi for a number of years. So one day he came and told me that there is a great holy man living in Uttarkashi whom it would be wonderful to go and meet and have darshan. So I inquired about him and he said that he was, he belonged to the Dandi Swamis. As I mentioned earlier, the Dandi Swamis belong to the Shankaramat and to the branches of the Shankaramat and they are usually Brahmin sannyasins and they carry a Dandi. It's called Dandi Swamis. So one of these, this person was a Dandi Swami and <clears throat> he was very learned in Vedanta uh, and also in meditation. It was at this time that he was asked to succeed and become the Shankaracharya of a mutt. Now, apart from the four mutts, which is Sringeri, Dwarka, Puri and Jyotirmatha near Kedarnath, Joshimat. These are the four Shankara Mats, although there is also a Matha at Kanchi, which is called the Kamaka, Kanchi Kamakoti Pitha, this is also a Shankara Mat. But the Sringeri Matha, which is the southernmost Matha, which is in Karnataka, does not accept, uh, ex accept the existence of any other Matha in the south apart from Sringeri Matha. So this is an additional Matha which is there. Although there have been great saints who have been part of this matha, like uh, the senior Swami of uh, Kanchipuram, whom I have met, I shall describe my meeting with him uh, later, later on. Uh, anyway, so these four matha, Sringeri, uh, Dwarka, Puri and Joshi Mat, which is Jyotir Mata. Apart from that, there are any number of auxiliary matas, which are small matas, which are branches of one of these. So this great man, whom Lakshman Giri spoke to me about, was a Dandi Swami who was supposed to succeed and become the Acharya, the head of a small branch mata of Sringeri. Now, <clears throat> he suddenly realized that if he took on and became a Mathatipati, head of a Matha, so many things involved, formalities involved. So instead of that, he declined. He said, please take somebody else who is next in seniority. I am not interested in becoming a Mathatipati and walked out of the Matha, came to Uttarkashi. After coming to Uttarkashi, he threw his dandi into the river and became a free Swami, no more a Dandi Swami. And he had not even a kamandalu or a begging bowl. He used to live by whatever food was given to him when he stretched forth his hands for the time being. He would eat and what is left he would leave for the birds, drink water from the Ganga and live quietly in a small kutir. And he would never ask, talk much. He tried most of the time to be in Mauna. So when Lakshman, ah, I got it, not Lakshman Giri, he's Lakshman Puri. So when Swami Lakshman Puri told me that I should, it's good thing to go and see him, I said, will he see me? He said, yeah, he'll see you, why not? So he took me one day. And he was in his kutir near the Ganga. So I went and prostrated myself and he smiled. He was a big built man, tall, very fair, with a 
a balding hair, head but grey hair. When I looked at him, I thought he must be around more than 80 years old. You know how it is at the age of 75, 80, 85. Old people are to be looked after so much even in our own homes. It's such a difficult thing to look after old people. But here was a man living by eating food with both his hands, drinking water from the Ganga, having refused to become the head of a mutt, having thrown his dandi into the water because he didn't want to be identified with any sect. He wore a saffron uh, girwa dhoti and a garua half sleeve shirt and uh, a blanket was his only possession. I was very touched and impressed by seeing him. I sat in his presence hoping that I could talk. Suddenly he decided to talk because Lakshman Puri said normally he's silent, he's in Mauna. Decided to talk. So uh, he said, what are you doing here? I said, uh, I am a brahmachari and I am searching for the truth. When I said I am searching for the truth, he smiled and he said, you have taken up a very difficult task. It is not such an easy thing to do. All my years I have given up my dandi, I have given up my kamandalu, but I am still searching. I was quite touched by it because many people do go to Uttarkashi for a holiday and stay for six months and come back and say they have become God-realized. They know everything. Here was a man who had spent all his life, who had given up everything, and who was saying that to search for the truth is not such an easy thing. I haven't found yet. I'm still searching. And believe me, he's not an ordinary man. A man who had studied the Shastras completely, I would say. Upanishads, Vedas. I think he had a very good knowledge of everything. Lakshman Puri used to tell me that he has had various discussions with him on uh, Vedanta, very deep discussions. Then he asked me, do you have a guru? So I thought for a while with my eyes closed and he said, no, 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 I'm not going to become your guru, don't worry, because I don't want to have a disciple. He said, how can I have a disciple when I haven't found it yet? And I said, yeah, I have a guru. Babaji is my guru. He said, Babaji, there are many Babajis. Which Babaji? I said, my Babaji is a direct disciple of Sri Guru Babaji. He said, ah, I've heard of Sri Guru Babaji. Yes, he said, wonderful. So you're lucky. I said, good. So do you think... Uh, I can meet him if he is around. I said, he has gone off, he will come back after six months. And then there were only five more months left. He will come back after five months. I will ask him if you would like to see him. He said, I would very much like to see him. Then we sat and meditated together for a while. And I saw that his mind was quite silent and settled. And then after a while, I quietly got up and prostrated and came away. So, so uh, another interesting thing was, after some time I got a little fed up of staying in that kutir. Because many people came to know that I was staying in the kutir. Especially, some of the brahmacharis and sadhus who were from Kerala came to know that I was staying here and that I was from Kerala originally. So a small network was being created. People used to come and sit down and talk and discuss matters and slowly from Vedanta it would go to politics and this whole thing was going on. So I decided that I will leave this kutir and go and stay in some place where people generally cannot gather and discuss and talk too much. I was looking for a place. Now one of the brahmacharis who happened to be kind of sent for tapasya from the Ramakrishna mission in Kerala from Trichur. What happens is, in ashramas like the Ramakrishna mission, a brahmachari or a sannyasi, sadhu, is not supposed to have things like a bank account and a passbook and so on. They are not supposed to have any individual lives. 
apart from the fact that they should control themselves, learn how to eat limited food, discipline their minds. Now, if it is found that some of the brahmacharis or swamis have committed something which is against the rules, for which they need to be disciplined, then usually they are sent to far away places, but places of pilgrimage where there is no Ramakrishna mission, there is no mat. Because if you, they go to a Ramakrishna mission center, again they will they get food, they will have everything, all the and luxuries that are needed for a sadhu will be there. So they are sent away to places like Uttarkashi. Uttarkashi is one of the fa favorite places where they are supposed to live for six months or one year and do tapasya, which means they have to go to Anachetra, beg for food. In the Ramakrishna mission, nobody needs to beg for food. It is available in the dining hall. So this is considered to be discipline. And then they have to meditate, study, do japa. So one of these brahmacharis, whom I had already known some years back, he told me that there is one house available which is on the outskirts of Uttarkashi on the way to Gangotri. Then I said, why is it lying vacant? Why is nobody there? He said, the problem is, first of all, there is no electricity there. And secondly, some brahmachari used to live there from Andhra Pradesh. And he had built a cave to meditate. And as soon as you enter the room, there are steps going down and underneath there is an underground kind of a chamber which he had built for some yogic practice or tapasya, kaya kalpa, something like that. So I said, then that is ideal. So I can go inside. He said, that is why nobody is going there now because this brahmachari, this yogi who used to meditate in the cave, got very troubled and frustrated and agitated due to various reasons and he decided to commit suicide. So he went in, put kerosene on his body and set himself on fire and died. So after it was cleared and everything, nobody stays there because of the fear that the ghost might come. So when he told me this, I said, that is an ideal place to go and stay because nobody will bother you. Uh, there was a little bit of fear and apprehension which slowly vanished because Babaji had always told me, the Aghori sadhus, they live near smashans, cremation grounds and such terrible places so that nobody will go and bother them. Everybody is afraid of going to the burning grounds. Only jackals and dogs are around in the night or maybe people who are tomb thieves or drunks, nobody else goes there. So I said, this is the ideal place because I would be completely undisturbed. First two nights, I found it difficult to meditate inside. Not because I saw anybody, but uh, I, there was a fear in the mind. But slowly, slowly, I learned to adjust. And very soon, I was free of it. Only one night, I remember, that uh, when I was meditating around midnight, I thought I saw, I heard somebody crying uh, as if they are very sad. Uh, the sound of crying came and I thought I saw somebody with a white cloth on their head walking up the stairs. That is the only, one and only time I had any such experience. But I dismissed it from the mind. And Babaji had taught me what to chant when you are afraid. So I chanted that mantra, thought of Babaji, and uh, continued to stay there. After uh, six months, which means uh, around April time, Babaji came back. So instead of going to the Kuti, he came straight there. And he said, so, so now you are staying in a haunted house. I said, yes, Papa, I'd like to stay here. He said, okay. There were two, three rooms there. He said, I'll also stay with you here. So he also stayed. So I explained to him, he knew. But I told him one night I heard a voice and I saw something. He said, dismiss it from your mind. This should not affect your geese. So you're free. Now, after a couple of days, I then he checked my Sanskrit how far I had gone, what I am learning. 
and he told i told him how sharma ji said that you send all kinds of people to him so he laughed he said yeah he's like he was a good man you know okay fine then i told him about the existence of this dandi swami ex dandi swami who was living in uttarkashi and he said he he requested that if you come back it would be possible for you to go and see him he said yes i i will go and see him i i i already had thought of seeing him so we will go i accompanied him he went there as soon as we reached there now that day this swami was sitting on a flat rock near the river when we went so as soon as he saw me and baba ji coming he understood that this must be my guru baba ji so he got up and uh, even though he was a very old man and baba ji looked always like a 30 35 year old man anyway he got up and tried to do pranams and baba ji did not allow him to do pranams he held his hands and said don't do it first you are a sanyasin who is wearing an ochre robe and the institution of sanyas is one of the most respected institutions in this country so i cannot allow you to do pranams to me i am wearing white baba ji said i am not i am not wearing gherua second thing is you are much older than me and you are very knowledgeable so you cannot do pranams so he did namaskar and sat down and then baba ji told me you do pranams so i did pranams to then he said to baba ji i would like to discuss certain matters with you is it okay with you baba ji said it's okay baba ji said do you want uh, him to go is it personal he said no let him stay because he will learn a lot in our discussion so i stayed and then they had a long discussion and he told him how he had studied what he had studied how much he had studied and because of which and still he has not touched that which he should have touched which is the truth baba ji told him see the problem is only one thing now you have gathered so much knowledge you are a good man but you have gathered so much knowledge in your head that the spark of the truth which lies in everyone hidden is now completely covered by the knowledge that you have studied now this was a completely new concept i've never even thought of this concept he said you are now conditioned by the knowledge that you have acquired you have given up your dandi you have given up your kamandalu you have given up your position as the head of the mat but you still have somewhere in your mind the feeling that you are better than others because you have knowledge he said now that is your last barrier if you can get rid of that then you are free then he explained he said he asked him have you read the ishavasha upanishad so the swami ji said yes i have read the ishavasha do you remember a particular shloka from the ishavasha upanishad which says that one who worships ignorance avidya enters into darkness which is quite all right we all agree that one who worships darkness or ignorance i mean ignorance enters into darkness but the next line immediately after that in the ishavasha upanishad is and he who worships knowledge enters into greater darkness and baba ji explained to him that some people explain it by saying that it refers to para vidya and apara vidya which means that ignorance is uh, uh, when they talk of knowledge he who who worships knowledge enters into greater darkness they are talking about apara vidya or knowledge of ordinary things and baba ji said if that was the case the rishis never said things which are not certain they would have definitely said para vidya and apara vidya nothing like that has been mentioned upanishad he said that is because 
if you have not got the explanation till now. So the Swamiji said, actually this used to trouble me all the time. I haven't found an explanation. He said, okay, let me explain, listen carefully. And he looked at me to see if I was listening carefully. He said, how does one acquire knowledge? Swamiji said, by studying something. He said, when you study something, what does it mean? What are you studying? He said, because I don't know about it. Okay. So, when you don't know about something, you try to know about it. You try to understand it. Fine. Now, when you have understood it, what happens? When I have understood it, it is stored in my memory. Right. So, when you have understood something, it is stored in your memory. And then you say, this is knowledge. Yes. Which means, anything that we say we have knowledge about, is something that has been understood and stored in the memory, which can be at any given moment extracted. Which means, it's stored in the memory, but at any time you can recover it and put it back again. This is what is called knowledge, any knowledge, spiritual, mental, moral, ordinary, yes, said. But the truth that you are seeking, the truth that we seek, is not a thing of the past, because all memory is something to do with the past. Otherwise, it's not called a memory. You can't have a memory of the present. The moment you have it becomes a memory, it has already gone to the past. It cannot be in the present. Now, the truth that you are seeking, which Vedanta talks about, is to be found in the present, here and now. It cannot be found in memory, because memory is always a thing of the past. And all the knowledge that you have is a thing of the past, because it is a memory. So when that ceases and the mind becomes free of it, then you will realize that the truth is right now here, moving every second without staying anywhere. Like the river that moves, because it moves, it does not gather any muck. The moment it stops moving, it becomes like a dead pond, which develops fungus and various other things in it, and becomes stale. So it's this moment of the mind, without clinging to anything, including knowledge, is the only way to find out what the truth is, because the truth is always in the present, and not in the past, and therefore is not in any knowledge that you have acquired. The Swami closed his eyes for a minute and said, I think now I have understood what you are trying to say. I think I have understood. Babaji said, that's fine. I think you shall be free very soon. And he got up and blessed him. And we walked out. Then we were scheduled to go to Gomuk, to Gangotri and Gomuk from Uttarkashi. Now, uh, I have to, uh, before that I want to tell you a small story, just like, similar to the story of uh, the Swami, Dandi Swami and Babaji. If you remember, if you all, I think most of you know, most of us know about the existence of a great person called Ramana Maharshi, who used to live in Trivannamalai. Thiruvannamalai is not very far from here. Now, I won't go into the life of Ramana Maharshi, but I'm going to just give you a small instance of what happened to a great seeker whose name was Ganapati Muni, who was a scholar in the Upanishads, in the Vedas. He had studied everything that one would require to move into the spiritual life. Ganapati Muni was also an expert on the Sri Vidya. Now, when we come to that when in Gomuk, as we travel, I will talk to you about that. But um, he was an expert in the Sri Vidya Upasana and all the scriptures that are uh, to be studied by the sadhak who moves towards the spiritual path. 
And after having studied all that, Karma Kanda, the Jnana Kanda, and all these, the Upanishads, the Brahmanas, the Aranyakas, he felt that still he has not reached the truth, he had not reached the Satya which he was seeking. There was an invisible but strong barrier that prevented him from breaking through. So he was searching for someone. He went to many places. Then he went to Tiruvannamalai. And there somebody told him that there is a Swami, unknown yogi, sitting in the Skanda Ashrama cave. In those days, Ramana Maharshi was not known. He was unknown. Actually, till Paul Brunton wrote his book, Search in Secret India, hardly anybody knew about Ramana Maharshi. So he was living in the cave in uh, called Skanda Ashrama cave. So why don't you go there? So Ganapati Shastrigal went to see him and Maharshi was sitting as usual with folded legs, looking straight. Ramana Maharshi hardly closed his eyes when he meditated. It was always open, but no movement. So he was sitting there quietly and peacefully. So Kavyakanta Ganapati Shastrigal, that's how he used to be called. He went and stand, stood in front of him, then sat down. No movement, no sign of recognition. After quite some time, his eyes started moving and he looked at him. Both of them looked at each other. Then he asked. Ramana Maharshi hardly spoke. He spoke very few words. So he did like this. What is the matter? Why have you come? So, Ganapati Muni went on into a long discussion on what he had come for. He said, I am so and so. I have studied the Vedas, I have done this, I have done that, Gita, I have studied all the commentaries of Gaudapada, I have done the Sri Vidya Upasana, I have been initiated in Shodha Shakshari Mantra, I am a Sri Chakra Upasaka, whole thing. But still, there is a barrier. How to get rid of so you know, he asked. So Maharshi is supposed to have smiled and told him, Can you keep quiet for a while? You have done so many things, you have been talking about it. Can you just keep quiet? That's all that is required. Because you are so caught up. Just can you shut up and sit for a while? So, Ganapati Muni when he heard that, you see, when there is a proper receptor uh, disciple and a proper teacher, and when both are in rapport with each other, then when truth is said, it immediately takes effect. Like a flash, Kavyakanta Ganapati Shastrigal realized what he was seeking. His barriers broke. And he became absolutely free. And then he came back and told people that there is a great jnani sitting up there in Skandashrama about whom you have no idea. Why don't you go and take his blessings? That's from that time Ramana Maharshi slowly came to be known in the world. And then Paul Brunton came and stayed with him for some time and said that he just sat and understood everything without a word coming from Maharshi. So that is when he wrote the book called A Search in Secret India with Ramana Maharshi's picture in it and he became well known to the world. Altogether, between going to Gomuk and Rishikesh and Uttarkashi and so on, I lived for three and a half years with Babaji. And during those three and a half years, I had passed through so many experiences, which I think it would have been impossible for me if uh, Babaji's presence was not there on this earth to guide me. And a couple of things I have to say during that period. One is our visit to uh, Gomuk. One day we set out from Uttarkashi to Gangotri. <coughs> We lived, we stayed in Gangotri for a while 
uh, in a kutir belonging to a Naga Sadhu. After two days, we started the climb to Gomuk via um, Chirbasa and Bojbasa. The first day, we stopped at Bojbasa, and there there was a tantric uh, yogi from Bengal who had set up his ashram. For travelers, there is no place there where they can stay or where they can eat in Bojbasa before that. His name was Lal Baba. And the ashram he set up was known as Lal Baba's ashram. It was all painted red. Because red color is very important for uh, these uh, tantra sadhus who practice tantra. So we spent some time that night there. And the next morning, we went off to Gumuk. Now, Gomuk, you must understand, is so high up. It's, I think, nearly 18,000 feet or so above sea level. Uh, and there, there, in those days, there was no accommodation available. Nowadays, you, you might be able to find some accommodation in um, Gomuk because the ITBP, the Border Security Police, Indo-Tibetan Border Police has a few places where you can stay. So from there, we just walked up to Gomuk, had a nice dip in the cold waters of Gomuk, which only in the first dip it is freezing, afterwards you will become all right. The secret is to keep a towel near you, take one dip, take a few quick dips and then come out and rub yourself dry before you freeze. So we had a dip in the river and then we decided to walk to Tapawan. Now, Tapawan is a big glacier that still goes higher than Gomuk. So we walked on. It took us uh, about a day, almost a day, that we reached uh, uh, a place which is the highest point. Uh, you can see the Satopant from there. The Bhagirathi peak is visible quite before that. And then if you look on the other side, you see the beautiful Gangotri glacier, which stretches for miles and miles with no tree, nothing in sight except a vast sheet of ice. Now that itself, at your first look, if you look at the Gangotri glacier suddenly, something happens to your mind. It also becomes like a vast sheet of ice spread all over. And it is under this that the Ganga flows out through the Gomuk. But you have to be very careful when you walk on the glacier because some places the Tapavan glacier has holes, which has a very thin covering. So you shouldn't break the ice and go inside. Very often travelers find skeletons there of people who have gone and not come back because there is no place to stay there. Up. And at the highest point of Tapavan, from Tapovan, you can actually have a glimpse of Kailash on the other side, the great Kailash mountain. So anyway, so from there, after spending some time in uh, Gomuk, I'm sorry, in uh, Tapovan, we came back because you can't halt there. There's no place. You'll freeze to death. I don't know about Babaji, but I would. So we came back. Now, in between Gomuk and Tapovan Glacier, the top of Tapovan, there are a few caves, generally not occupied by anybody. But sometimes there are people who come and stay there in summer. So when we came back, we went to one of these caves where one of Babaji's old associates, who he simply called as Dadaji, and he was from Bengal. He was staying in one of these caves. So we spent the night. We decided to spend the night. Dadaji said, why don't you stay for two, three days? This young man is very tired, Babaji. You cannot make him go up and down like this. So Babaji said, OK, fine. You stay here. So he made uh, food for us. Whenever he came and stayed there, he came with sack loads of provision. So after a long time, I ate some rice and put it to curry there. It's very difficult to cook dal in those heights because the air pressure is very low, but potatoes you can cook. Anyway, so, and one evening, Babaji told uh, this man, whom used to call Dadaji, 
Dada, why don't you initiate him into the Sri Vidya? So he said, but why should I initiate him into Sri Vidya? You are more advanced than me, you are senior to me, you should initiate him into Sri No, 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 he said, I want you to initiate him into the Sri Vidya. So he agreed. So we lit a fire, sat down and I got initiated into what is known as the Bala Mantra. Then it's called the Bala Tripura Sundari Mantra. Then the Pancha Dashakshari Mantra, which is a 15 lettered Sri Vidya Mantra. And the Soda Shakshari, which is the 16 letter Sri Vidya Mantra. Now when I say this, you will wonder what is this mysterious Sri Vidya Mantra. I have to explain this. Sri Vidya is called the Tantra Gayatri, just as the Vedic Gayatri is the mantra Om Bhuva Swa and so on. The Sri Vidya is the what is called the Tantra Gayatri. Now, in the practice of Sri Vidya, why is Sri Vidya practice? What is the advantage of Sri Vidya? Why do people do it? Now, for this we have to go into the understanding of what Tantra means. People have all kinds of wrong notions about Tantra. They think that Tantra is something to do with dead bodies or something in cremation grounds and so on. Some people do practice it there, but it actually has nothing to do with these matters. The problem is Tantra is divided into two parts. One is called the Samaya Marga and the other is called the Vamachara. Vamachara, the left-handed path and the right-handed path, which is called Samaya Marga. Now, the Vamachara is usually for people of a certain category who cannot rise above their needs unless and until they are exposed to it for some period of time. But the idea is finally to rise above and not get stuck there. Now, Vamachara therefore advises people to use the pancha makaras, which includes liquor, uh, meat and so on, so that one, after experiencing it, gets rid of the craving for it. That is the intention. But usually what happens is one gets stuck to it. There is no, it's very difficult to come out of it, mainly because of the lack of a proper teacher who can guide one to get out of it. And it is Vamachara which is usually associated with sitting in cremation grounds and all these kind of things. Basically it is meant to get the fear out of our minds. It has nothing to do with the ritual of any dead spirits or anything of that kind which is all nonsense. Now Samaya Marga, also in Vamachara, the Devi or Shakti, Parashakti means supreme energy. Now, you know that the whole world is pervaded by energy. There is nothing that does not work with, without energy. So, the essence of energy or the root of all energy is called Parashakti. So, it is usually depicted as feminine in gender. Because a mother who keeps the child in the womb is always a woman. So, the female aspect of the supreme reality worshipped as the mother goddess is what is meant by Sri Vidya. She is also called Raja Rajeshwari, Tripura Sundari and so on. Now this energy which is the counterpart of Shiva, so it is Shiva and Shakti. Now in Tantra a great deal of importance is given to Shakti, even more than that which is given to Shiva because the understanding is when everything is quiet, when everything is tranquil, then it is Shivam. When there is activity and movement, then it Shakti presents herself, manifests herself. Now, the whole world is pervaded by Shakti. Einstein has proved it in physics, that everything is energy. That energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. Now, this Energy which changes in one form into another is what is known as Parashakti. Of course, it is worshipped in the form, different forms, but this is Parashakti. Now, as far as the human individual is concerned, this energy dwells in every living being 
after having done the work of creating this body in the womb at the bottom of the spine in a triangular uh, shape like a coiled up snake this energy which is parashakti as the individual manifestation in every human being is known as the kundalini so kula kundalini means actually the shakti who remains unmanifest hidden in the bottom of the spine of every living being now samaya marga tantra as practice in samaya marga is not much to do with the external worship of shakti in the yantras which is called the shri yantra and so on which are symbolic manifestations of the inner mechanisms but it is to do with touching the inner shakti which is the kundalini and through various practices including devotion allowing it or letting it or making it ascend from the bottom of the spine chakra by chakra or center by center to the top of the head which is the sahasrara chakra or the thousand petaled lotus uh, where the presence of shivam is acknowledged and when the shakti reaches there shiva and shakti become one this is the concept of ardhanarishwara which is where half is man and half is woman this movement it's not physical it's to do with the mind uh, now samaya marga deals with this process of purifying the nadis shushumna nadi the central channel now that nadi is also called kula so therefore the practitioners are also called kaulas those who walk on this kula through which kula kundalini moves and this practice is what is known as the shri vidya now the mantra taught in this only consists of bijaksharas there are no words there are only sounds you know bija akshara is a concept in which the ancient scientists spiritual scientists who are known as the rishis have discovered that each sound has a certain effect on the outside world as well as in the inner psyche and they have selected some sounds which are called bijaksharas for example hreem ha ra im hreem this is a sound it has no meaning it represents shakti but actually it has no word meaning in the dictionary now om now om is called pranava because it is the root sound for all the mantras om actually does not mean anything it means it's mostly a sound although symbolically it represents creation preservation destruction and so on actually the more importance to is to be given to the sound of om than to the meaning of om it's called pranava because it is the beginning of the movement of prana now this these bijaksharas like hreem etc are uh, put together in a certain order and chanted in the mind starting from the lowest center which is called the mooladhara and which is represented by a triangle with its apex down and chanted at each center there are six centers starting from mooladhara and reaching the seventh center which is the sahasrara now each of these centers a particular sound or bijakshara mantra is used to clear and purify those centers and shakti is led up in her wild dance from the muladhara up the other chakras till she reaches the sahasrara chakra and the union between shiva and shakti takes place there and the whole mind body and soul of the practitioner upasaka is in complete bliss which when one has experienced there is no craving for any of the smaller little uh, 
sensations that we normally crave for as human beings. This is the whole thing which is known as Sri Vidya Upasana. So this is the thing that was taught to me by Dada, this Bengali person. And uh, I learnt the mantra from him and I continued to chant it till a certain point. Even now I do it sometimes in meditation because it is a very, very potent way of keeping the energies in circulation up and down one's consciousness or one's Sushumna Nadi. Now, so having stayed there for some time, we came back again to the plains and went back to Rishikesh. Before stopping, I have to mention something else. Uh, around three times I have been to Gomuk in those days. Afterwards I went again, that is a different thing with those days. And out of that two with Babaji and once alone. Babaji said, go alone. And once on the way to uh, Gomuk, while I was traveling to Gomuk, I met a, a foreigner who was living there in one of the caves and practicing uh, Kriya Yoga. Uh, I'm not supposed to mention his name. Babaji used to call him the German. He was from Germany, from Stuttgart, a scientist from Stuttgart who was experimenting on, who was a neurologist from Stuttgart, who was experimenting on sound and the effect it has on the human brain. So, Babaji had told me that when you go to Gomuk this time alone, meet uh, the German and stay two days with him in the Kutir. So, I agreed. So, I went and met him. So, I asked him, how do you know Babaji? How did you know Babaji? He said, he had come to the Himalayas many times because he was very uh, much interested in this uh, experiments, research on the connection between the brain and neurology and the experiences that yogis are supposed to get in deep meditation. He had, did a, he had done a great deal of study on the pineal gland and the pituitary gland and the effect of the hormones on the system and he had mapped, he was beginning to find out ways and means, I'm talking about many years ago, of how to map the moment of energies in deep meditation. About the pineal gland, which is a very, very small organ, which is shaped like a little green chili, not as big as a green chili, but shape, is somewhere in the midbrain, very close to the limbic system that we have. All this I learned from him. And it was considered for a long time to be a vestige organ which had no um, function for the human body, in the human body. Few years ago, they found out that it controls the sleeping rhythms uh, and uh, has, uh, uh, secretes a hormone which produces sleep. When actually when you go and when it is dark and you pull the curtains and switch off the light, when it becomes dark, the pineal gland releases a small amount, infinitesimally small amount of a certain hormone into the system. I forget the name of that hormone right now, which immediately produces sleep. Now they are selling tablets um, which contain this hormone. So that if you have a jet lag, if you have traveled for a long time, I think it is serotonin, I'm not very sure. Uh, and when you come back from long distance, you have jet lag, you can't adjust to the time. So when you're awake, normally you should be awake, you would be sleepy. And when you're normally sleeping, you would be awake. Now if you eat a serotonin tablet, then your sleeping pattern is adjusted. I'm not saying that you should, there are other ways and means of doing it. Because dependence on drugs is not a good idea at all for the mind. Uh, all I am trying to say is that an organ which was considered a vestige organ is now found to be a very important organ 
which sir, which which controls the sleeping pattern, the sleeping rhythm. Now, according to the neurologist, according to the German, he said it probably has other functions which he was trying to discover. He was experimenting on these. He was doing a lot of research. He was also doing a, a research on some of the older writers on neurology who believed that the human body, the human organism is uh, wired for a spiritual experience. Whether you have it or not, depending upon various factors, it already has the faculties which, can, which uh, make the brain capable of experiencing what is called a spiritual state. So he was also doing a lot of research on that. Later on, when I read Oliver Sacks and uh, you know the famous neurologist uh, Oliver Sacks of New York who wrote a beautiful book called A Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Uh, it's all about neurology and his different patients. And when I read that and later on when I met uh, uh, this uh, uh, friend of mine, uh, Dr. Ramachandran, who wrote uh, phantoms in the brain. I, he's a professor uh, and a practicing uh, psych, uh, neurologist in San Diego. I found out what the German was trying to say li with a little more clarity. Uh, he said, so I said, but how did you meet Babaji? He said, that is a very interesting story. He said, I've come several times to Gomuk. And once when I arrived at Gomuk, and I was staying in a little kutir, wondering if I can find a genuine yogi somewhere who can guide me on this matter of the brain and neurology and kundalini and so on. He had a good knowledge of Hatha Yoga Pradipika, Sat Chakra Nirupana. He had also read Sir John Woodrow's Serpent Power. So he was theoretically well equipped. He said one day he saw a tall, fair gentleman with the red uh, almost brown hair matted and tied up on the top of the head and wearing only a white piece of cloth he said in those in that cold of gomuk walking towards him uh, he was in a way surprised to see somebody like that but beyond that he said he was completely shocked when he came near him and said in german guten tag which means good morning good day so he also said guten tag and then they sat down and Babaji said to him, uh, I can't talk much in, when my German is not so good, so can we talk in English? So he's, they talked together for a while and then he found out that this was the person or the kind of person that he was seeking who could actually through personal experience guide him towards these matters. So, he, Babaji decided to spend a week with him and at the end of the week, he was also initiated into Kriya Yoga, the practice of Kriya Yoga by which the Shushumna Nadi is cleaned and the energy is made to rise up to the Sahasrara Chakra. So, this is the same Kriya Yoga about which Yogananda Paramahamsa writes about in the autobiography of a yogi. Uh, he was initiated into Kriya Yoga and when I met him for the last, for the, for three years he had already been a Kriya Yoga practitioner and a Sri Vidya Upasaka and um, Babaji had told me that he was quite an advanced sadhak and that I could learn quite a few things from him. So I stayed with him for some time and learned as much as I could. Then. After that, we went back to, I went back to Rishikesh and met Babaji again and spent some more time wandering in Rishikesh, basing ourselves in the cave of uh, Mauni Baba, in Mauni Baba's cave. <clears throat> now, that was the, one of the most beautiful parts of my life when I was convinced that this is going to be my life forever. 
I was going to walk on the banks of the Ganga as free as a bird, eat what food comes, not bother about an agenda. There was no agenda actually except that I wanted to finally go to the essence of consciousness. There was no other external agenda and not even a program in the sense that Babaji's way of life was not to decide beforehand where one should go. One morning he would get up and say, ah, now we will go to Uttarkashi and we go to Uttarkashi. Then he said, now we are returning from Uttarkashi, you return from Uttarkashi. And there was no fixed uh, blueprint. Everything was free and fresh air, free for all, for which you don't have to pay <laughs> and, and so on. And I was enjoying this life and meditating deeply and in blissfully living in this condition, thinking that this is going to be my cup of tea forever. When Babaji woke me up from that wonderful sleep, one day by declaring that now, it was around three and a half years I was with him, he said, whatever you have to study with me for this, this particular time has already been done. And now, I said, now what, Babaji, any more advanced studies? He said, no more advanced studies. You have to go back. I said, go back? He said, yes, you have to go back to the fields, go back to your parents, live normally like anybody else, and then pursue your spiritual practices. Uh, I will guide you when it is necessary. I said, are you saying that I'll never see you again? He said, no, 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 no. Whenever you need it or whenever I think you need to see me, I will see you. As I said, when I thought now I have uh, reached uh, a beautiful state of mind, Babaji brought me back to reality. And he said, now you have to go back to your home, stay with your mother. Eventually, he said, you'll get married, you have a family, stay normally, don't change your clothes. And he gave me a reason for this. He said, most of the people who will come to you are not sannyasins. People who come to you will be householders, married people, working people. And their problems can be sorted out only if you have lived a life and know what it actually means. He also said that renunciants and sannyasins should not give advice to married people on life family matters because they know nothing about it. So it's only when you have a wife or you have a child, then you know the compulsions of living. So go back and live normally. So I said, where should I go? He said, go back to Tramandram. Now, as I have mentioned to you earlier, that time, at some point, Babaji had uh, given me two copper rings to wear in my ears, so that I belong the external paraphernalia of a Nath Panti is to wear earrings. Sometimes they wear here in the cartilage, but he said this is enough, you can wear. And uh, also, I was not cutting my hair. The Nath Pant, nobody cuts their hair. It was quite long. In those days, I had a lot. My hair used to grow very, very fast. And it, I used to tie it up, keep it like Babaji, pretending that I'm imitating him. So on. I had a Rudraksh Mala. So when I was leaving, Babaji called me and said, are you going like this? I said, yes, Babaji. He said, no, already your mother and your parents are feeling sad because they didn't know where I was. For three and a half years, they probably thought that I was dead. Afterwards, I came to know that they had advertised in newspapers, missing persons list. He said, in this condition, if you go and stand before them wearing rings and uh, matted hair, that will be the last straw. Probably somebody will get a heart attack. So he told me, go and cut your hair. Take out your 
uh, uh, what is that earrings and throw them into the Ganga and then you go to Delhi give me some money buy a ticket from Haridwar to Delhi the station one of my senior disciples one uh, Mr. Agarwal will come and receive you he knows you are going and he will take you home and you stay with him for two days from there he will get you clothes to wear decent clothes is the words he used other words he used so that you wear a shirt and pants and then shoes and then go home I said all right whatever you say I was said but do you are you serious do you really think that I have to go back he said yes you have to go back there is no other way and you know this is your mission after you go back you must spend some time with your parents live a normal life get some job after some time you, sh you can leave the job go and join the Ram Krishna mission for some time I want you to learn the discipline there then and meet all holy men and spiritual people and yogis wherever possible study everything that is required because you will find people from all walks of life coming to you in later years when this happens you should be well equipped to teach them according to the way that they go and not try to change their ways and last he said at the end of all this exposure you are to go and meet J. Krishnamurti stay for some time and see how this works how he works what's happening all this is part of your understanding it should be part of your equipment so you should be well equipped to handle all kinds of people who would at some point come to you so I said well, Babaji I don't want any people to come to me I don't want to teach and get caught up in this he said look it will happen at some point and I will give you the green signal for it only then you need to start you don't have to start anything now because if you open your mouth and say anything now you will probably be talking rubbish so I said alright so from there I went going back was so difficult from Babaji one is leaving Babaji two is leaving the Himalayan beauties the beautiful state where I used to live and the third is going back into this thing about relatives and father and mother and sisters and friends and this whole you know what it is it's a net in which one is caught over and over again about that, all that I was not supposed to tell anybody or talk to anybody about all these things that I have learnt I have to keep my mouth shut now that is a very difficult thing to do when you go to a place where you see a holy man talking and you suddenly realize that this sometimes this man is saying absolute nonsense and you can't open your mouth you have to sit and listen so I that was a very difficult part of my life to do anyway I went back in Delhi just as Babaji had said uh, Mr. Agarwal came and took me in his expensive car to his house in Kailash he also gave me uh, as Babaji had instructed him to give me the practice of Kriya advanced practice of Kriya which is called Talabhya which is something to do with what in, in, in Hatha Yoga is called Khechari Mudra it's slightly changed it's called Talabhya in Kriya Yoga so he taught me that and then he sent for the tailor and I got a new pair of clothes he bought me a sleeper ticket from Egmur to Trivandrum I'm sorry from Delhi to Egmur and Egmur to Trivandrum and gave me also some money and uh, came to the station and dropped me and would go by so one evening I landed back in Trivandrum clean shaved uh, wearing uh, reasonable respectable clothes and then I was thinking how to go home I found that the railway station area has not changed much in three and a half years so instead of hiring an auto or calling anybody I of course there were no cell phones then so I thought I'll walk it's not very far so I walked 
with a small bag in my hand and then I went to my house and entered the house and my mother came out and she was shocked. She started crying and all that, she hugged me and then my sisters. My father came afterwards in the evening. Anyway, things, nobody said anything. My dad was not angry with me. He only said, next time when you go somewhere, you tell us where you are going. Don't go off like that. Because they thought that I was dead. So I spent some time in Trivandrum. And like Babaji said, I decided that I would use every opportunity that I get to learn something from yogis or holy men who are in and around the place. So, that's when I went to Kanyakumari, as I said earlier, met Maima and got her blessings. I met Gopala Swami, of course, when I was a very small boy. Uh, I went to Abedananda's ashram and spent some time because Swamiji was old and still there. He lived another year. And then something which is very extraordinary, which I have to tell you. Between Trivandrum and Kanyakumari comes the temple of Suchindram. It's a very famous Hanuman temple, Suchindram. Before you reach Suchindram, if you take a turn to the left, you'll come to a place which is called Marthuamalai. It's an ancient mountain, Marthuamalai. On the top, there's no way to go up except through walking and trekking. On top of Marutva Malay, uh, there are many caves, small, small caves. There is one, one cave. To go to that cave, you have to go through a tunnel and come out and then you will find a cave. It's a small window and if you look, you see the whole thing around, complete scenery. It's, the cave looks as if it was man-made, but I think it is a natural cave in which people came later and built some places where one can sit down and so on. So I decided to go to Marthu Amale. Uh, I wanted to be alone and spend the time by myself. So I got into a bus, got down and went to Marthu Amale. After that I went several times with my friend Ranjit who was my closest friend and who used to keep in touch with me even when I used to run away somewhere. Even after that, I have gone off here and there many times, short periods. So, I went to Marthuam I climbed up the steps. By the time I reached there, it was evening. I had carried some food with me, simple food, bananas and few idlis packed. So, I went up and in the night, I sat in one of those caves all alone. I was meditating. Suddenly, I was woken up by somebody shouting, Naina, Naina, like that. So I said, it could be then. I opened my eyes and there was this man, very shriveled man, in uh, uh, wearing a small dhoti, very soiled dhoti. He had a moustache but he had shaved small hair, very thin man. And he kept saying, Naina, Naina, Naina. I actually didn't understand the meaning of Naina until I went and settled down in Madanapalli and learned a little bit of Tamil. I'm sorry, Telugu. Telugu Naina means Appa, father. Mm -hmm. So, he, apparently he always said Naina Naina and nobody knew what he was talking because he used to talk in such, some words in those days I did not know that it was Telugu. People there said he blabbers. But now I feel that it was Telugu. Anyway, he made me sit there, Naina, Naina, Kucho, something he said, and sat down. And that day, he talked to me in Tamil. And when I came out and told people, they said it is impossible. He never talked Tamil. But he actually talked to me in such clear Tamil and gave me a good exposition of what is called Raj Yoga. It is a very interesting concept because he said the difference between a Raja Yogi and an other Yogi 
is that the other yogi starts practicing his attention from the bottom up. He said, in Raja Yoga, we practice from top to bottom. I said, how is this possible? Because normally you start meditating from the Muladhara center, which is at the lower part, and then go up to this center. He said, no. You see, he said, it can be done, but it is very dangerous. So in what way dangerous? He said, if there is a well, and if there is water at the bottom of the well, and if you want to take the water from the bottom of the well, by going down into it and trying to take the water, there's every chance that you might slip and fall into the well. So what should we do? So he said, stay high up on the ground, and use a bucket with a rope and take it up from below. So I said, how does it apply? He said, you concentrate on the higher centers from um, uh, Adnya Chakra, uh, from here to here. He said, there are seven centers there also. So you put your attention there, and then from there, you shift your attention down and pull up the energies one by one, instead of trying to go up, pull it up from up above. Now, this is a concept which I had never heard before. So I said, this Raj Yoga concept, I have never heard before. What do you call it? He said, we call it Shiva Raj Yoga. And it is what was taught by Agastya to Tirumula. So, it was, this was a beautiful lesson I got from him. And then, he also came and slept in that cave. But what I noticed, something very peculiar was, normally we sleep with our legs straight and body down. He sat down, stretched his legs, bent his head in front, and did something like what in yoga is called Paschimottasana, which means resting the forehead on the knees and holding it tight, he fell asleep. In that position, I have never seen anybody sleeping like that in my life. He said, this is how yogis should sleep, they should not lie down. Okay, I never attempted because I like to lie down and sleep, but anyway. So, the next day morning, I got down from Maratva Malay and went back. After that, several times with my friend Ranjit, with my friend Madana Gopal, with a motorbike, we used to go all the way to Maratwa Malay, sometimes go further up to um, Kanyakumari. But after that, only once I met him, once in my life. And that was when I went with Madana Gopal one day, we went up to the cave, I left my chapels there and went inside and uh, my friend was sitting inside when he went and picked up those chapels, brought them and put them in front of my friend Madana and said, Namaskaram, Namaskaram. So he's, he wondered what he was saying. He said, bow down to those chapels. So afterwards my friend told me, I think he wants you, wants me to accept you as my guru. I said, that is left to you, whether you want guru or no guru, but if you want to do it. That was the second time I met. After that, I heard that he had passed away. Then, uh, I went to a place called Takkalai, which is also very close to Kanyakumari. It's on the way to Nagarkoil, where there is the tomb of a holy man, a Sufi holy man, whose name is Takkale Veer Muhammad Sahib. It's a tomb. It is said that he was a blind man who used to live there and he was a weaver who used to weave clothes and he had a small boy to help him. He would put his hand on his shoulders and walk around. The boy was his eyes and he lived his life. His tomb is there even now and in some way in our family, one of our ancestors is, was his close disciple, so his tomb is also there. So one day I went there, because I had heard about Takkale Veer Muhammad Sahib. My grandmother used to tell me stories about him. So I went to the tomb. It's a very peaceful place. <sighs> Meditated for some time. And uh, got into a conversation with the man who was looking after the tomb. So you, I told him, please tell me something about him. So he said, 
that he lived here for many years. He was blind and he used to meditate for a long, long period of time. Even in the dead of the night, people never saw him sleep. He would be sitting and doing his prayers or sitting quietly and meditating. Uh, then he told me a very interesting story. It seems one day, three Arabs who were experts in, in the Quran, the Islamic uh, scripture, they came to Thakale hearing that there was a saint called Pir Muhammad Sahib. But they were told that this man did not do his five times prayers. Uh, he was uh, never went to the mosque, but he would simply sit quietly and meditate. Although sometimes he said Allah, Allah, but he never went to the mosque. And that he had never gone to Makkah to uh, Hajj, which every Muslim is supposed to do in his lifetime. So they came actually to make him understand that this is not the way you should do five times prayer every day and that you should go to Makkah and if you need help we will give you money and so on. So they came and uh, they met him and they told him that you have not gone to Makkah. Uh, it is incumbent on all Muslims to go to Makkah so if you don't have money we are there to help you. So, he made them sit for some time and then he's supposed to have, you know that the, he used to have a pot, water pot kept inside near his weaving machine, hand weaving. So, there was a water pot. So, I believe he told them, after doing your prayers, please come here and look into the pot. So after doing their prayers, they came and looked, all three of them looked into the pot with a white cloth thrown on top of the head. And when they looked, suddenly the water cleared and they saw a scene. They saw inside the water pot, on the water, they saw Makkah. And there, they saw a lot of pilgrims going round and round. The uh, Kaaba and along with that they saw themselves also going round and in front the Pir Muhammad Sahib was also going led by this small boy with his hands on his shoulders going round and coming out. So when they saw this they were so astounded and embarrassed that they had asked this holy man to improve himself when they themselves didn't know about him. That they begged pardon of him and said, we didn't know that you are such a great saint. We are very sorry about it and went back to, to wherever they came from. This is one of the stories of Takalapirma. So I went there and then I also used to visit all the little temples, mosques, tombs, wherever I could find them. I went one day, traveled to Tirichi and went to Sri Rangam and had a darshan of uh, uh, Ranganatha there who is lying in the sleeping posture in Ananta Sayana. And then from there I went to Nagur where there is a mosque, a tomb of, Na of a great saint, Sufi saint who is referred to as Nagur Andavar. Very close to that is the Velankanni shrine where hundreds and thousands of people go every day. So I went to the Velankanni church also, spent some time quietly. You know the thing about uh, a church is that, in our, is that first of all, as soon as you enter, a, especially old churches, I have, when I travel in Europe, I make it a point to go to these old cathedrals. They are so peaceful and beautiful inside. First, because nobody utters a word. Everybody is silent. And there is a beautiful altar. And if you are lucky, there are these huge organs which play devotional music. Nobody is singing, only the music. These, this organ music is so peaceful to the soul that you enjoy it sitting there on the benches which are kept there. I love to go to these uh, uh, these cathedrals, old cathedrals. Of course, 
in many parts of Europe, nobody is attending service now. So many of these cathedrals, some of them have been turned into supermarkets now or into <coughs> tourist attractions. <coughs> but they are out of this world. So since I used to go to the Palaim church also in Trivandrum, I went to Velankani church, spent some time there, meditated because I believe that A person like Jesus Christ cannot be an ordinary human being. It is not possible. Which ordinary human being would say, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you? Which ordinary human being would say that? Here, if somebody turns one year, you are ready to kick him in the stomach. How can you forgive somebody? Not only forgive, do good to them that hate you. I mean, this is extraordinary. I think it is not an ordinary man. It's something uh, you cannot define. I think if Jesus Christ was born in India, he would have been one of... Now we have Dasha avataras. They would have had 11th avatar also put up because it's not like a human being. So this is the thing, of course. In the name of religion, battles have been fought, people have been killed. This is because of established religion. It is nothing to do with the true essence of religion. No great teacher has asked or uh, encouraged people to engage in this kind of thing. It's that when it becomes established, all these things happen and it is organizational. One of my person whom I respect very much, J. Krishnamurti had a story about this. He used to say that once the devil, you know, a devil is uh, Satan. Devil and his close friend went for a walk. So, as they were walking, uh, the devil bent down and picked up something and put it in his pocket. So, his friend asked him, what have you just picked up? The devil said, I have just picked up the truth, satya, dharma, and so on, the truth. So his friend said, you have picked up the truth and put in your pocket. Then your days are numbered, you are finished, because you are the opposite of truth. You are supposed to be untruth, you are supposed to be darkness, you are supposed to be cruelty. So if you have picked up the truth and put in your pocket, then your days have ended now, you will be destroyed. And the devil smiled and put his hand on his friend's shoulder and said, don't worry friend, I'll organize it. Which means truth also, if it is too organized and structured, it can become the untruth and it can, this is what has happened. No founders of religions, no great beings have ever put man against man. It's the organizations that create all these problems. If you look, you will find that every one of these great beings, this is my personal experience, have been spiritual, caused no harm to others, and never wanted anyone to cause harm to anybody else. Of course, there are different ways to the truth. As Babaji used to say, if you have to reach a pond to drink water, you can reach it through different paths. Now, these are all different approaches to the same truth. You cannot say that that path is wrong and this path is right. There are different ways and it suits different people to follow different paths. We cannot say this is only right path to go. There are different ways. There is a story of how um, four people belonging to four different categories wanted to, were feeling thirsty, they wanted to drink water. One of them, who was a Greek, said that he wanted to drink aqua. Another one said that he wanted to uh, drink water. The third one said he wanted to drink jala, which is again water, jalam. The fourth one said tanni. But actually, they were all trying to drink the same water. The big fight broke up between which is good for thirst, tanni or aqua or water or jala. 
not knowing that thirst is to be appeased by drinking the same water, no matter whatever name you use for it. That why the Vedas declared, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vedanti. The truth is one. Wise men may call it by different names.
and come to their sense of consciousness.